Pokemon Scarlet and Pokemon Violet's overall quality has come as quite a shock to all of us. We're all super excited for yet another great Pokemon game to come, so that means it's time for me to pull out all the stops yet again. That's right, I'm going to do what I do best, give you the most in-depth analysis possible that no one else on YouTube can give you. For anyone new here, I'm Johto Johnny, and I'm known for my gaming analysis here on the platform. Don't believe me? Well then, you're right, talk is cheap, so let's not waste any time getting started. Here we go. What better place to kick us off than right at the very beginning in the live action segment? What if I told you the game's title was hinted at as soon as the first 10 seconds of the trailer? In the very first shot, the stairs have a neon yellow glow, the same color as the Pokemon logo. Soon after, the security guard repeatedly flashes their flashlight around, creating rainbow effects galore. Fun fact, in the color spectrum, Scarlet and Violet exist at opposite ends, and we can see that clearly here in the rainbow's color spectrum. The hints get more on the nose though. In a subsequent shot, the security guard moves his flashlight along the wall, quickly switching its color from Scarlet's use of the color orange to Violet's use of the color purple. Very clever move by the cinematographer. The open door also gives off Scarlet and Violet lights. Now, our guard enters the Scarlet Violet Room, and it's filled with artifacts from Spanish history, obviously hinting at the use of Spain and the Iberian Peninsula. One thing that stood out heavily to me is, amidst all the artifacts, this symbol of a spider web containing an eye is embedded on the chair here. It's very prevalent in the shot, so I imagine it is a high level of importance. If anyone has any information on this, please write it down in the comments. This clock, as well as many other artifacts and landmarks across the trailer, have deep ties to Spain and Portugal. So if you want to deep dive in all these, please watch my video on that after this video. I will not be going over every tie to the Iberian Peninsula in this video. The two shields have different fruit depicted. Here's a scene from the end of the video so you can see them better. There's sliced citrus on the left, and the round grapes on the right. Real quick, I'd like to turn your attention to the Japanese logo reveal of the games. As you know, Scarlet is a sort of red color, while Violet is a sort of purple. The Scarlet one has angular slices when it sparks, and the Violet one has round bouquet particles. Now, we already know we're dealing with oranges and grapes, as well as orange versus purple depending on what version you get. However, this leaves implications for the legendary designs for the different versions. The angular approach of the Scarlet version insists on a legendary that will be more angular, possibly more aggressive looking. The rounded bouquet of the Violet version hints towards something more smooth and having a lax design for that version's legendary. Anyone else excited to see those? I know I am. While we're on the titles, I'd like to point out one more thing. The star on the logos might be a hint towards a gimmick for this generation, as past logos have featured items related to the gimmicks for those as well, such as Mega Evolutions and Z-Moves. These stars are essentially sparking diamonds. I wonder what exactly they'll be used for, there's no way to tell for now. Now it's time to get extra... juicy. Ha! <laughs> See what I did there? We come into the first shot of the game footage. Beautiful as it is, there is a lot to look at here. For starters, the Pokemon Center is staring us right in the face as it stands next to the grand opening to the city, sporting a new holographic overhead that will be amazing for signaling players in an open world where a Pokemon Center might be. I also appreciate that it's located outside of the city rather than inside, as we'll need it much more while out and about in the routes. Funny thing is, there's also one to the right side of the city as well. It looks like we'll be well taken care of all around the huge city, as the more I look at it, the larger it seems. This right entrance actually seems to be the main entrance though, as we see there are structures in the same vein as the city leading up to this Poké Center. There is actually another entrance on the opposite end with a bridge leading up to it, but I do think that this right side still is the main entrance because that's also the direction that the Pokémon League's Pokéball little button part is facing. A rainbow adorns the sky, not only giving a very pleasing look to the imagery, but also once again hearkening back to the scarlet and violet existing at opposite ends of the spectrum. This city is the one that we later see hosts the Pokemon League, as we can see it from the shot. There's a flat plaza at the foot of it, with trees surrounding the edges. 
The lower elevated portion of the Pokemon League provides a sense of elevation even still with its castle-like structure. The rest of the city boasts a variety of different building styles that still maintain cohesion not only with each other, but with the landmass they're built on. The city, much like the open world we'll be playing in, is seamlessly woven into nature. Save for this giant building in the back. It seems to stand tall in its own secluded area. And most likely, it's a research building of sorts or something related to education. It looks like that kind of building, if you ask me. I'd like to also direct your eyes to this odd structure just outside the main chunk of the city. It's flat, but takes the shape of the base of a pyramid. I wonder what this is. It looks ancient and was most likely preserved. This isn't the only thing located outside the city though. Look at these buildings here to the right. It looks like a chain of three residential buildings completely separated from the city as they're located on their own hill. I don't really see a way to get up there from here. So either we need to climb somehow, or the walk-up is facing away from the city. Crazy! On a simpler note, there is a small body of water just in front of the side entrance we have a frontal view of. I love me some bodies of water. Now, the biggest question I have for this shot though is how far can we go? What are the boundaries? Can we climb, fly, ride Pokemon again like in Legends? I sure hope so, but one thing is for certain. Out of all the highest elevated landscapes we can see, I can almost guarantee that we can at least traverse this cliff to the left here, as tree assets were placed there. Sadly, they're not placed on any other of the high or distant mountains, so those are most likely boundary points of sorts. Then again, maybe not, we might be pleasantly surprised. Finally, we can move on to the next shot, which actually has much less to tell us, however, there are some big revelations here such as just how much water is separating all these islands and land masses. We almost certainly will have a way to traverse water. Let's hope we can surf on a variety of Pokemon. We can also easily locate this area on the game map we get later on. It's very clearly this portion at the top with a huge body of water. It seems this location exists at the edge of a cliff with waterfalls pouring out into the ocean. If that's the case, then this is gorgeous and a true mark of natural beauty. This shot is also the first to introduce to us just how good the lighting engine is. Watch in motion as the sun glimmers not only to the camera, but also through the clouds and over this crack between the land. We can also see the shimmer of the ocean behind. It's so gorgeous. Now, there's a nighttime shot. Not much to say here except the stars don't really twinkle, and the skybox looks very similar to Legend's nighttime skybox, save for the clouds. Clouds are very different in this game compared to Legend's as they're more gassy, realistic, and significantly closer to the player from the skybox. Now, I loved Legend's anime-esque skyboxes. While the new lighting engine works wonders for the day, I think Legend's has prettier skyboxes in general. Then again, this game isn't complete yet, so I'm interested to see if this changes at all. Oh, by the way, we can see the league from here, so this places us slightly to the right of the Poké Center we saw at the main entrance I mentioned. Now, we're inside the city, and wow, the fog effects are incredible. It really gives a sense of atmosphere to the location. I wonder if this is a weather condition, or if this is caused by elevation. I'm hoping for the latter. We also have another Pokemon Center here, still boasting a holographic symbol above itself that we can see peeking above this building on the side. But is it me, or is something not quite right with the Pokemon Center? Hmm... More on that later. Anyways, this also seems to be a town square of sorts, as we see a circular structure at the center here at the foot of the stairs. All around, I love this city already. <laughs> now, let's glimpse the wilds. In this sweeping shot of the fields, Starly are flying around like never before. This makes them even more lively than in Legends, which is crazy. They flew around in that game too, but it was only sparked by the player running up to them. Now it seems like they just kind of fly around in general. There's also one we can see standing in the grass here, so they didn't all fly away. Regardless, I love the sheer amount of grass petals and their wind blowing physics. As we reach out over the prairie, we see not only a slew of windmills, as Spain is rightfully huge on renewable energy, but a closer look at the Pokemon Center. Here is our confirmation that there is indeed a huge difference in their appearance than what we're used to. And no, I'm not talking about the hologram. That's right, the Pokemon Center now seems to be a seamless outdoor facility with no walls. It looks like you walk right up to it, 
kill your Pokemon and walk away without going inside, or possibly even talking to NPCs. This is a great step in making tedious tasks more fluid, and I love it. It also fits with the seamless open world motif Pokemon SV is going for. I'll also point out this huge tunnel to our left. That's quite the grand cave entrance. We already know caves are confirmed by a later shot, but it's quite nice to see an entrance already. Beyond that, there's a gorgeous flowing river to the right between the mountainsides. What a wonderful development of nature. Seeing closer to the windmills now, Hopip are seen fluttering through the sky as the wind propels them. I love this neat little touch. The Pokemon really do feel tied to the world in a more natural way than ever. This next shot does nothing more than confirm Bounce Sweet and Petalil are in the game. <laughs> But the shot after looks almost exactly like the Crimson Mirelands from Pokemon Legends, just in this new art style and with better lighting effects. The ground is actually wet too from the rain, which really helps to sell the weather. Nice touch. Now, this shot shows the true beauty the game can provide. The lighting, foliage, Pokemon animations, textures, everything. This looks remarkable. Not much more to say about it here. Boy, is it nice to see modern marks of civilization in an open world Pokemon game. Something about seeing these signposts here in this mountain path fills me with excitement and joy. And Meowth! There's something comforting about all this. I don't know how to explain it, it's just Pokemon Legends but in modern day, which is great. I love Meowth's updated model, I love the little light above the sign, I love the lighting the moon provides in this cut path between the mountains, I love the sheer amount of foliage and the improved draw distance. They definitely placed this scene here knowing it would have this effect. I think it's because this is the closest thing we've gotten to picturing the early generations of Pokemon in an open world. Great job to the marketing team. Now, we're in the desert, with Stonejourner walking through it. Another example of the new Pokemon models, it's really great to see Gen 8 Pokemon be more fully realized. You can see the X's on his legs are protruding with actual bevels, and the little stone pebbles on his head bounce as his legs hit the ground. His mouth is now an actual crack through the center of his stone, and of course, his eyes have actual depth rather than just being textured just like all the other updated models we've gotten since Legends. This is an astounding amount of detail they've added to this model, and I'm so excited to see more Pokemon benefit from this. Ice Q, where are you at? <laughs> now, according to the analysis from my good friend Arisugawa Rei, Stonejourner being in this desert might reference the Kromlech of the Almendres, a megalithic complex in the Portuguese Alentejo. Similarly, Kalos is host to similar stonehead structures in the town of Geosange. If both places have these stone structures, it might hint towards this new region being the region that Kalos went to war with a thousand years ago, and what led to the remnants becoming landmarks there. Just a fun speculative thought in the midst of all this stone cold analysis. Anyways, back to hard facts. We now get to see a more major town square in the Barcelona inspired city that hosts the Pokemon League. Here's the flat plaza I mentioned earlier in the video, which is modeled after Barcelona's gorgeous Guel Park. We also get to see Pokemon do even more in their habitat, but this time in a city. Swablu likes to stand on the electrical wires. There's also a Psyduck just chilling in the square. Speaking of the square, it features all the different Pokemon types as emblems in the center. Let's see if you can find one we've never seen before. Until then, let's direct our focus towards the very center, where we have a rainbow taking the shape of what seems to be half a Pokeball. We actually get to see the other half in a later shot, so I'll talk more about that later. Regardless, it's clear that this region is the most colorful we've ever seen, which actually fits with the scarlet and violet motif as that represents the two, two ends, ends of, of the, the color, color spectrum. spectrum. I've said that so many times. <laughs> in this next shot, we get to see Pikachu do a fun animation. I'm not sure if it's new or not, since I don't really pay much attention to Pikachu as a Pokemon. I know, what Pokemon fan am I? But what catches my eye most in the scene is the NPCs. Finally, they're expressive and have movement. It's about time the NPCs and Pokemon caught up to the 21st century. You'll notice they do a variety of things as they traverse the city. In the previous shot, a man walked with a briefcase while talking on the phone. In this shot, a child plays with... an instrument? or uh, something. Either way, it's a step up from NPCs in any previous Pokemon title, and I'm here for it. The final thing to point out in this shot is the giant star on the wall in the background. It very much resembles the star in the logos for the game in Japanese. 
Something's up with that for sure. The next shot sees Blissey sleeping in the square. There's an orange in the tree, so I wonder if in Pokemon Violet it'll be a vine of grapes instead. Also, Man's is sipping on his drink. See? More lively NPCs! So cool! Oh, so Viper, how I love thee. Those scales look so good on you, bub. Actually, Pokemon textures were added in Pokemon Legends. You just didn't notice them as much because of the cell shading. But you can definitely see scales added to reptilian Pokemon like Gyarados, and fur added to Pokemon like Flareon and Lucario in that game. You can see them more in the evolution screams of that game, as well as in Doras like in Snowpeak Temple. Anyways, the textures and models only get better as we see another one of my personal favorites, Larvitar, traversing deep dark caves with his buddy. The textures of the cave look amazing, and Larvitar's updated model brings him to life even more. Magnemite has a shine to him, just like in Pokemon Legends, but here it's more prevalent just because of the new lighting engine and new art style. Also, there's like a diamond or something on the top of this lighthouse, I think. Now, an up-close shot of the beautiful Pokemon League, clearly modeled after the Cathedral Sagrada Familiar. Let's hope it ends up being as grand and epic as these shots suggest. Let's continue to what I assume to be the professor's lab, sporting an eye-catching Dratini fountain, Dratini confirmed, and a host of lavender bushes. Really, all over. Now, unless this is specific to Pokemon Violet, I am willing to bet we're going to see a descendant of Professor Laventon here. Perhaps they'll also be close relatives with Leon and Hop from Galar. Now, we get more of an aerial view of Gwell Park's replica, with a clearer view of the center Pokeball and Pokemon types. However, I don't see any new typings, but please, once again, let me know if you do. We can also peep a small fountain in the back, and as the shot progresses, we get a look at a fashion shop. It very much stands out opposed to the other shops in the area, so I can almost guarantee we can go in. For anyone who was worried that we wouldn't be able to update our player character's clothes or looks, you'll be very happy about this. Now, we see our character's house. This is probably the wealthiest Pokemon protagonist we've played as so far. Looking at this gorgeous lot of land and housing, good for them. This home is closely modeled after traditional Spanish architecture, specifically to that of Cortijos Andaluces or Cortijos on Luchas. I'm not sure which way to pronounce that. These actually feature outdoor courts in the center of them, so I'm excited to see if this house includes one. Again, oranges in the trees. Maybe these will be grapes and violet, but we can only see the kid in scarlet version running through this area. You can tell by the orange shorts. I really love the physics of the clothing blowing in the wind. I think that clothes hanged stiffly on the lines in Pokemon Legends, so this is a nice upgrade as well. Now, the next shot shows the character running from the professor's lab, with the previous shot showing us running towards home. Is this implying the professor lives right across from us? Because if so, that's wild. The interior of the home sports plenty of Spanish knickknacks, including this painting of a Sevillana dancer, cementing that this house is in Pokemon's version of Spain. Unfortunately, there's also no signs of an entrance to that courtyard I was hoping for. Up in our room, the trainer has a luxurious widescreen TV, an OLED switch, an ice ass hat, some private school clothes, a leather backpack, a stylized potted plant, a quality poster, thick curtains, collector DVD sets, books on display, leftover Christmas boxes? <gasps> This is the wealthiest kid we ever played as. Um, yeah. Also, the map is on the wall, but it looks like really boring. I hope this isn't the whole thing. Anyway, what the heck are these balls? Yeah, I hope you all learned something new. Stick around the channel for more overly in-depth analysis. I do this all the time and would love to see all of you more. I'll see you guys in the next video. And until then, I've been Johnny. Peace out.